you. Thanks very much. Um, very pleased to be here. I'd like to pay respect to the Gadigal mob and to all of you. Uh, I'd also like to say what a great title, Making It. I've made it so well I've got 17 children. Um, uh, uh, not really. Um, but I'd like to speak um, as a Greek-looking Aboriginal who's worked as a waiter in a Chinese restaurant that was owned by a white bloke who happened to be gay. Not that there's anything wrong with being white. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'd like to speak from the perspective of um, a phrase that I coined a few years ago. When you've got art, you've got voice. When you've got voice, you've got freedom. And with freedom comes responsibility. And it's great to see that in recent times, a lot of the leaders in our arts industry have become more responsible with the voice that they carry um, about Australian theatre, about Australian arts in general. Quite often, my background as an Aboriginal person, if we just look at this little chart that I drew up today, which we'll be auctioning later, um, if, if this is the shape of Aboriginal people, and this is the shape of the dominant culture, and this is the gateway, when I began life uh, in the 60s, early 60s, um, the assimilation policies were in full swing. There'd been 37 legislations written to take away children. In fact, my sister was taken. And it was a shitty time to be alive. It was really hard. And they made these legislations and tried to make us change our cultural shape. And what had happened before that were um, a couple of hundred years of massacres and and tearing down of our culture and our shape. Taking away our leaders, taking away our entire social structure and marginalising our voice to the point where it was only right if it was in that shape. And in many ways that was the basis of theatre because theatre is an extension of society in this country. So Aboriginal people, people rallied. Pemaway, Windradine, resisted. We don't see them enough in history books. But there are other weapons of resistance, other than the spear, the rifle, the nulla nulla, the marching in the street. And one of these weapons, uh, great weapons, was the arts, the voice of the artist. And it became amazing. Our organisations in the 70s uh, that began, began because of uh, Musos doing benefit concerts because of theatre. Bob Mazza, Uncle Bob Mazza, told me the great story of when he was um, a, a young man playing bass <laughs> and wearing these, these fantastic glasses, this photograph of him playing bass. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, yeah, they came up to me when I was playing bass and they asked me to act. And so I said, yeah, no worries. I said, what role did you play? He said, oh, the usual, a wife beater. Um, uh, Kylie Belling, uh, the first Aboriginal graduate from VCA. Um, did you get many roles? She said, always, uh, but always the servant. And so when I stepped into film and theatre and uh, music, um, it began for me, I was investigating deaths in custody. And there was death everywhere. I'd come back from the army uh, where there was a lot of violence in itself. Came home and got appointed to the Royal Commission um, seeing the world through a mother's tears, lots of death, lots of sadness, lots of pain. I went out to my first sort of dinner party and a lady in a red dress um, knocked over a glass of red wine and she said to me, as if my mere presence offended her, she said, so tell me, why do your people kill themselves in jail? And I realised I realized at that point what was killing our people. And it was the attitude. And the attitude was socially engineered right across Australia. People didn't know. They thought that if they're comfortable, uh, the dominant culture thought if they're comfortable with this shape, then we should be comfortable. If their jokes are funny in this shape, then your jokes should be funny in that shape. Uh, John Harding, who's a playwright, said to me, I don't know how many times, excuse me, my nipple's ringing. Um, <laughs> He never said that. Um, so, Layla, this is my daughter, Layla, who's going to take my phone. Don't answer it in case it's another mother. So it's... Um, uh, 
John Harding said to me, I don't know how many times I've seen Aboriginal people go out of their way to make white people feel comfortable. And, and I, I put that in a play of mine called The Charcoal Club, which was at the Spiegel tent. Um, anyway, I, I went off after this woman knocked over this glass of red wine and uh, uh, said, uh, you, you know, basically your people are the problem and how dare they kill themselves and make me uncomfortable. And there were three things that struck me. One was that we, the assumption that we killed ourselves in jail and that it was a cultural thing. Two, that it was us and them. They weren't Australians, they weren't human, they weren't um, to be accepted, meaning I wasn't. And the third thing was how little she actually knew and how she was offended. And I made a decision at that point to um, pursue the arts and uh, tackle this horrific attitude. Of course, um, I didn't realise that I'd be poor as a black fella trying to get a job. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but I stepped into the arts and I didn't know much about it. I'd never seen a play before, so I went and um, or made a film. I'd made a couple of films without realising they were films. My brother was head of the um, uh, Indigenous branch of the Australian Film Commission and he started a program called... Um, who said that? Oh, hello, darling. That's my sister girl, Rhoda. She owes me 50. We'll see later. Sander <laughs> uh, Celluloid. And... Um, what happened is uh, Bob Mazza and a whole heap of others rallied. Uh, my company got engaged to do the cross-cultural awareness program and we used Jane Elliott's brown eyes, blue eyes. And every day we'd tell these stories and what I did was I told stories of deaths in custody. And every afternoon Uncle Bob Mazza would talk them out of me um, because it was horrific reliving that again and again and again and again. And, you know, the usual thing at night time, you have nightmares and toss and turn, you get up and do it again and again. And people would stand up literally and say, I'm not into this bullshit. That's the way it was. And that's the way it was when I lectured at the police academies as well. So this attitude thing was all encompassing. And what came out was the greatest uh, series of short films that ever came out of Australia at that point. And uh, one went to Cannes, they won AFI awards, they ended up in schools. It became this sort of almost... Um, pirate sort of distribution, people running with them and taking them everywhere. And then I went and seen a lady called Liz Jones. And we did them, I did Harry's War and No Way to Forget as a play. But I also took handfuls of these writings to her. And uh, they were scribblings from the deaths in custody days. And she said, why don't you write them down? And Liz Jones runs La Mama. So she said, go and see a play. And I'd never seen a play before. And I thought, oh, I'll have a crack at that. And um, so I went and seen a play and I had a crack at it. And I wrote down conversations with the dead. And I got drunk for two days and wrote it down in a flat in Clifton Hill. Liz Goff was there, who's a, a great dramaturg. I don't know how she put up with the drinking. It was so intense. There was a birthday party that week also, which Paul Kelly played at. And I recorded an album on the weekend. And I was pretty tired by the end of it. Um, <laughs> so Aaron Pedersen was living with me at the time. And he, he turned around and he, he said, it was all going good until he walked outside and he said, well, it's easy to kill a man, but it's bloody hard to talk to his mother. He said, I thought I'd go and get a hamburger at this point. <laughs> and, um, anyway, we knocked out the play and um, what happened then? Oh, then we took it to uh, Jill Smith, the manager of the Malt House, played a key, key part then. They put on a whole heap of plays. Um, uh, and they became, I think it was five plays. They're, they're in a book called, uh, by Currency Press, called uh, Black Inside. And we had this massive season at the Malt House. Il Bidru was part of it. There was all these wonderful um, agencies that stood up and, and promoted the guts out of this thing. And then after that, it stopped. There was no black theatre for a while. They had a change of artistic directors, and there was only sporadic plays at the Malt House for quite a few years. And more recently, I did a play with uh, working with Chris Mead, um, my bald brother, and Wayne Blair, um, my little brother, and we, w we did a play called Walking Into the Bigness. So my entrance, my, my attempt at changing this access point to the wealth and power of theatre and film and music and the arts generally was very much about um, a, a duty to trying to change the cultural tapestry of Australia, as opposed to um, having the luxury to practice art for the sake of art. 
And I, I think it's, it's very much like that for many Aboriginal people. I'm just going to refer to my notes because I've forgotten where I'm up to. So, um, I can't read them. Uh, when I think of it, I uh, ended up with lots of films and music and I started to use film as like a collective therapy and plays. I'd go into the prisons and do plays. There wasn't a lot of work around uh, for theatre practitioners, but for black theatre practitioners, you not only had the problem of trying to get through this access point, because you're quite often cast into the cultural corner, you carried a massive cultural load. And I, I want to demonstrate what that cultural load is, yeah? This here, I'm not sure, can you read that? Uh, would you like me to read it out? Oh, you're right. Before our white brothers arrived to make us civilised men, we didn't have any kind of prison. Because of this, we had no delinquents. Without a prison, there can be no delinquents. We had no locks nor keys, and therefore among us there were no thieves. When someone was so poor that he couldn't afford a horse, a tent, or a blanket, he would in that case receive it all as a gift. We were too uncivilised to give great importance to private property. We didn't know any kind of money, and consequently, the value of a human being was not determined by his wealth. We had no written laws laid down, no lawyers, no politicians, therefore we were not able to cheat and swindle one another. We were really in bad shape before the white men arrived <laughs> and I don't know how to explain how we were able to manage without these fundamental things that, so they tell us, are so necessary for a civilised society. John, John Fire Lame Deer, which I think is a pretty cool one. What do you reckon? <laughs> so, all of that that we had was torn asunder. And this is us here. I'm trying to find which one's the pointy... Oh, what do I do there? No, it's a different one, thanks, Tom. That was my son telling me how to operate technology. <laughs> um, so th this here is the tribe of the beautiful people. Uh, Gunda Jamara, I'll, I'll just come, come back into the light and show you this. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, so this is how we were, and there were great trade routes, and there was a whole societal structure. And if you look at the 1943 Maslow hierarchy of uh, social structure, you'll see, or the uh, hierarchy of need, you'll see that that's we had all of that, all of those five key points. And then we became this. And one old man said to our, said to me, "They're like veins." And this is where a lot of our theatre comes from: the struggle between trying to reclaim and reinstate and have this all the time, at the same time living in this world, which is, is a massive cultural load. So what is culture? In Australia, uh, from when I was a boy, our culture was invisible, or we were a problem and a burden. And then I started to read about heroes and warriors. My mum, when I was uh, about 12, 11, gave me the book Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and Papillon. And from Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, I learned about resistance. And from Papillon, I learned never give up. When life slaps you down, get up and slap the bastard back. You know, I slapped the thing so hard, I'm wondering why it hasn't, they haven't taken it off me. Um, and, and then I learned about cultural interpretation. And I learned about cultural loads about 15 years ago. I knew about them before then, but I, I want to show you, when you, walk, when you talk to an Aboriginal theatre practitioner whether they're a behind-the-scenes person, whether they're a producer, whether they're an actor, whether they're a writer, they write from this perspective. And I need a volunteer. How are you going there, brother? <laughs> you nervous? Yeah. Do you fly up then? <laughs> Can we, I'll just get you to just stand there. And what we'll do... I need another volunteer. Who can, no, no, just stand there. Look to the front. Don't be scared. The arms down. Relax. Uh, OK. All right. You ready? OK. Anyone here watch Harry Potter? Yeah, just hands up. Yeah. Uh, young lady, would you mind standing up? Yeah. Would you mind being Hermione from Harry Potter for a moment? <laughs> I just want you to change Davo here into a 19-year-old non-Aboriginal girl. Any type of spell will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done. Please grab a seat. OK, now we need a name of, for her. Anyone got a name? For Davo? Beryl. Beryl? 
<laughs> oh, thank you very much, all right, Beryl. All right, so let's imagine, I need a volunteer to come up and write things down on the board. Good on you, Chris Mead. Thank you, brother, come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Oh, look at you, you handsome thing, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to start up that Curry Hair Fusion Clinic <laughs> and make it reconciliation. So, so, so we'll, just, uh, we'll just write cultural loads. We'll use a black pen. Oh, you can flip it if you want. Oh, you just do it here. Yeah, here you go. Uh, cult cultural loads. So... Let's say you pay tax, you've got a job at the real estate agent. Yep. Don't put these inside each other, I'll think it's Freudian and I'm not into that type of reconciliation. Okay. Um, so you pay tax, little job at a real estate agent, yep. got a little flat, you pay rent. Yep. Yeah. Two bedroom? Oh, two and a half. Okay. And you got a boyfriend or you play the field? Oh, uh, you know. Just, bit loose. Yeah, a bit loose. Okay, yeah. all right. So you, you, you go to the doctor a lot for STDs. <laughs> so, um, uh, a social, you hang out a lot? Yeah. A bit of fun here and there? Yeah. All right, then you've got a um, uh, little car for that drive of shame on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go to the gym? Of course. Yeah. Uh, and family relationships. Oops, there we go. So that's about, everyone agree that that's what we all sort of carry, Blackwater Brindle? Yeah? Just a general grunt will do. I know it's early in the morning for you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now we're going to do... Hermani, you there? Okay, could you change um, Beryl into a 19-year-old Aboriginal girl? <laughs> there you go. Well done, you're very good at this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're an Aboriginal girl. Let's see what you carry. So, you've Eastern tribe. So they've taken away your language. So do you want to know your language? I think so, yeah. Okay, you've got your language. Yeah. Your father's dead, because mm -hmm. 52, 57 is the life expectancy, so you carry that. Um, you look after a lot of siblings? Yep. Okay. All right, geez, how are you going there? Doing really good. Yeah. Um, now, in Victoria, 97% uh, of Aboriginal people face discrimination at least eight times a year, and 70% worry about whole family copying it. So, a lot of discrimination. I, you get followed in shops. Yep. Oops. Oh, oh, there you go. You're losing oh, it. You need no. a cousin. You need a cousin. Oh, excuse me. What's your name? Oh, you can't. Yeah. What's your name up there, brother? You in the green shirt? Jo Come up here, Josh. So, Josh, you've been in jail. You've been writing because most black fellows. Any Aboriginal? Many? How many Aboriginal people here? Just hold your hand up. Okay. Who here's got family in jail? Just hold your hand up. All of us. <laughs> That's the way it is. So, Josh, welcome, please welcome Josh, if you would. So, so you've, you've been in jail. Just stand there, Josh. Don't touch them yet. Um, so you've been in jail. So you've got, out, so you've got agoraphobia because you were taken away at the age of five. You've been in institutions your whole life. You never go outside. All right? So you're living in that flat there. And you're here with Cuzzo. You're also suffering from a thing called lateral violence where there's a conflict between your family and the local organisation. Yeah. Sometimes it erupts in violence. Yeah? So in going out, uh, what's the percentage, what's the chance, any Aboriginal person in the room, what's the chance of uh, Beryl getting into a, a physical altercation? Okay. Everyone agree with that? Chance of violence. Okay, how much money are you handling out of your wage weekly to family? Anyone? Any Aboriginal person? Okay, there we go. Um, when you go to the local shop and get followed, how many times out of ten going to the local supermarket do you get followed? Any Aboriginal person? Okay. Oh, you know what I do when they follow me? I turn around and follow them back. <laughs> I say, where, where are we going? <laughs> or I go, hmm, hmm, you're going to turn me, brother. <laughs> Just get back, sir. You're making me uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so, Josh is a bit of an aggro person because in jail he can't read or write properly, even though that's why he was taken away. So, Josh is uh, getting his mates to read the letters out to him. Beryl's been writing and saying, I've been fighting with this mob again and again. So, in jail, he's been jeering himself up. So, when he gets out, he's going to go into protective mode. Next thing you know, you've got 15 funerals a year, which is the average. 
That's uh, from a report I did called Forever Business, um, which is online. You can get hold of it. Interviewed 131 Aboriginal people. So this is uh, your practitioner coming into practice, okay? Their, their artwork. Uh, 15 funerals a year. Bang. Sister's dead. Four kids. Should she take the kids, everybody? Yes. Hands up for yes. Okay, four kids. Statistically, these kids are going to have either otitis media, trichinoma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, ADHD, or another social order dysfunction. Pick two, anyone. Diabetes. Diabetes. ADHD. Yep, another one. Okay. You're not doing too good here, are you? Yeah. How are you feeling there? I need bigger arms. Bigger arms. Josh, at this point, flips out. Uh, hold on a minute. How many people, Rachel Maz, are going to stay at this house for the funeral? <laughs> How many? At, least, at least 20, did you say? 20? 20 people. Is there going to be alcohol there? Okay. Are there going to be police? Is there going to be a raid? Josh is going to lose it. Josh, you better hand over these because you're going back to jail. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll just pop me at, do pop me at the feet. Okay, we'll just pop me at these feet. There. Thanks, Josh. Round of applause for Josh. Okay. So, here we go. This is your average Aboriginal practitioner. Now, not everyone carries this massive cultural load because sometimes family protect them. Sometimes they get to dodge it and duck and weave around it. Last year, eight funerals for me. I only went to about five or four. I can't remember. Um, speaking to my uh, nephew today, they just turned off his uh, uh, extended family uncle's life support system yesterday. And he's in a high-pressure situation at the moment. So these types of things is when you're going to collaborate, when you're Aboriginal artist, be it actor, be it arts administrator, be it stagehand, writer, director, producer, this is what they walk in with. I'm going to give you a round of applause, I reckon. <laughs> Kamani, could we change him back, please? Shazam, there you go. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Mate, I'm very good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, when I, um, what I do with my art, I chose to um, not practice art full time because, as we know, it's hard to make a quid. But also, um, I was into community capacity building. And so I do a lot of things. I go to communities where there's a lot of suicides and where there's a lot of violence or potential violence. And I do workshops on um, how to resist that violence. And I quite often use art. So I'll go into a prison and I'll build a thing called what I call cultural foundations. So I'll work with a prisoner. What's your tribe, brother? Oh, you don't know? Well, we'll find out. Um, do you know about this hero? And they may not. In many cases, people don't know of our resistance fighters because on the missions, we were silenced. So I talked to them about uh, Pemilway. I talked to them about um, heroes of the resistance in all sorts of shapes, men, women. Marge Tucker, for instance, um, housing so many foster kids and giving birth to the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency. I talk about um, Mum Shirl. I talk about... Um, uh, Uncle William Cooper, all of these people, and I try and track them so that they have some type of connection. And it creates a cultural foundation. Now, the parallel for that is this is what it does for our community. We never used to see Aboriginal people on TV. Um, in fact, my brother, Wal Saunders, used to say when the TV was left on, as it was in a lot of houses before remote controls, will someone turn that white man in the corner off? And we all looked straight at the TV because we knew what he was saying, except for me because I was 14 and 13 or 12 and a bit silly. I'd look around and think, we've got a white person visiting us. <laughs> like, um, so the arts for me became this tool to go into communities and do a thing called collective therapy. 
And I just want to show you an excerpt of, uh, of, uh, of one film. Um, oh, hold on. This is about my kids. I took them home to catch their first fish where 1,500 generations of their grandmothers and grandfathers caught their first fish. And that reflects in my art as well. That law, that business uh, in the land, in your mother, that sings through you. And at night sometimes I drag them outside and I make them look at the stars and I say, um, uh, what you're looking at there, 1,500 generations of your grandmothers and grandfathers looked at. And then if there's a little non-Aboriginal mate with them, I generally say to them now, what you're seeing is in 1,500 generations time, you want someone to say that about you. So we create that uh, collaboration, that link over. So um, to me, this is what theatre should be. A place where you feel safe to be yourself within your cultural fr framework. A feeling of safety that comes about by seeing, feeling, experiencing the positives of your people and culture. Uh, speaking, reclaiming language, customs, or reclaiming cultural practice. They're, they're the important things for me personally. Um, uh, and I won't go into all of those in detail because we don't have enough time. Uh, could we show the first um, film there, Brother Will? My name's Richard Franklin. I'm a Gundi Jamarifara, which is family of man in my language. And I'm the writer and director of the play The Brady Bunch. <laughs> Bunch is essentially a play about an Aboriginal community. It's a snapshot of a small Aboriginal community seen through the eyes of one family and an Aboriginal worker. The Brady Bunch is about an Aboriginal family who are not only the victims but the perpetrators of lateral violence. It, it's a microcosm of the wider Aboriginal community. So I took that into communities and played at a couple. We had 120 Koori kids turn up at one session and the first question they asked the actors on stage, it was the question and answer was, do you fellas ever feel like killing yourselves? And the counsellors and workers were all there and they'd never had these kids collectively and openly speak at that level. And the actors were quite stunned and shocked but they spoke openly but they never spoke as uh, actors removed from the community. They spoke as part of the community. They spoke, at, yeah, we feel that. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I've carried a lot of coffins myself. Yeah, my home, there was a lot of scars on the soles of my family, and this is how they got through it. Yeah, I've got this strong uncle or auntie that I work with. So it became a ray of hope, and the play goes on to... Um, the, the questioning went on to actually seek out answers. And so we're trying to raise money at the moment to send that in again to communities or to send it to other because uh, there's 500 Aboriginal tribes and nations, to send it up to the broader nations for them to reinterpret in their culture and their language. So part of the role I use, what I call collective uh, healing, or that I use theatre for, is that collective healing. In prisons, in places where you get people to use their own voice, um, tell their own story and tell the scars on their soul. Most Aboriginal people I know, uh, and Islander people I know, brilliant storytellers. But they're navigating, like our, our Beryl here, she's got a foot in the black world with that massive cultural load and a foot in the white world, and the load doubles again. So she's, every day she navigates, every day she gets out of bed, she's picking up that load. And she's ducking and weaving from society in a whole heap of ways and wondering whether she can get through this gateway to the wealth and power that broader society enjoys whether it's in the arts or whatever. The arts is a microcosm, is, is, is part of that, but it's a wonderful tool that, that if, if, if enabled, if properly resourced, Aboriginal Islander people can contribute to the cultural tapestry of this country in ways that are unimaginable. We can change the very identity of this country to a place where, which we can all call home. I, I'll, I'll just show you the next bit um, that I do. Uh, when you're ready, Will. So this is Nicholas Rogue's walkabout where Jane um, Harrison and I rewrote the text. Um, it became my heart to thunder. It 
just to see girls. Sweet song, please. <laughs> please hide this needless thunder. And I would sing my song. So um, the idea of that was to look at what Nicholas Rogue had done and where the blackfellow was just plumage. So he was a character, but he was, he may as well have been a leaf or a dog. He wasn't a, he had no words in the actual film. There was no attempted interpretation. It was a vehicle for the protagonists, which were non-Aboriginal, but it was put up as this wonderful Aboriginal film. So what we did was humanise him. We humanised what has been dehumanised. To me, that's the next stage of theatre, not by just me or other Aboriginal practitioners, but by everyone in the industry. Humanise what has been dehumanised. And what happened recently um, is a play I was in, uh, I was going to say involved in, uh, called Walking Into the Bigness, which uh, went on in Melbourne, and it was uh, directed by Chris Mead and Wayne Blair, and it was a series of stories. Wayne acted as me in a play called Conversations with the Dead up here at Belvoir. And this play, Wayne came down home and we had a couple of yarns. Um, I told him about tiger snake swarms, which is a long, complicated story, and I won't divulge now what it is. There's no such thing as tiger snake swarms, but he thought there was for a long time. Um, <laughs> he was very paranoid about sleeping in my country. <laughs> anyway... Um, we did this play, and what we did, we got a whole heap of people to act as me. Uh, a black, white, men, women, different ages, all strikingly beautiful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of the play was, again, to facilitate voice. Um, and it wasn't about... Um, to me, it, it made a statement about not only who we were as a nation, but who we are and who we can be. And it was a very brave thing to, that Chris and Wayne did because what they did was said, OK, there's no black and white here, there's just the story, a, a very human story. And when people came in black or white in the audience to see it, what they seen was the human who carried cultural loads because of society because of society's attitude, the very thing that I've been fighting my entire life. So, so we'll have a quick look at that, and then I'll, I'll wind up and we'll have a few questions. I've missed out on a heap of stuff, but anyway. You are right there, Will? I think it's touring, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think it's going to... Um, so, basically, to sum up me um, and my role, it's um, been very fortunate. Um, I got to be... see the doors closed. Yeah, the doors, the, these doors here. In a whole heap of life. When I was young, you couldn't hope to be more than a labourer or um, an apprentice. That you got to see all these heroes come through, people like Uncle Harry Williams and the Country Outcasts, Uncle Bob Mazza, and others who opened doors. And then all of a sudden, I find myself on the world stage with plays at the UN, uh, films at Cannes, um, and stuff like that. And I end up going home to work, um, and just on community capacity building, to be with my family. Now, I just took a new job. 
Uh, just started as the head of VCA, uh, Aboriginal Willen Centre. And I'm hoping that we get 20 bums on seats this year. I'm hoping that we change the world a bit. I'm hoping that we get so much Aboriginal voice out there that it changes the identity, the identity of this country in such a way that we end up with the first black Prime Minister. And she's going to be great. <laughs> So, um, to finish up, I'm uh, a little bit emotional, I feel a bit sooky. <laughs> I'm Richard Franklin. I, tired but very proud to walk alongside so many great warriors, black and white, who changed this country. And I want to say thank you. <laughs>